have mistreated them and have you know mistreated their land. So that is a very controversial political issue that's infused with um, with racism. Um, but it, but those are the, you know the, but those two groups tend to be the most vocal about their hostility toward the Chinese government. There are numerous other um, minorities in China, but the um, but the Han Chinese, which is the ethnic group that I belong in, which is sort of the usually the Chinese people you see, um, they make up the majority of the population in, in most places in China, particularly the big cities. They are what's considered Chinese people. Um, so they would be in a position to dish out racism, but very rarely would they be on the receiving end of it. Um, and Chinese culture tends to be, um, Chinese culture is not shy about its views on other races. So here in America, we believe that you know people of different races uh, can excel and compete, and we believe in racial equality, even if we don't always um, practice it in the perfect way that one would hope. But in China, I think Chinese culture traditionally has been much more, um, I guess, much less tolerant of, of other races. Uh, this doesn't mean that. It, it, what, I mean, Chinese culture is premised very much on. This idea of superiority, you know, that it has a grand civilization, it has a glorious history, and that there are a lot of cultures that are viewed as being somewhat as being inferior to Chinese culture. And so there is a sense of that in um, in, in China. Um, I think the poli what you know, how it manifests in your daily interaction with people, and how it manifests in policy is a very different matter, but there is definitely the sense of superiority, it's a sense of pride that a lot of people take in their own culture over there. Yes, sir. And then, kind of a follow-up question, did you have the African American students in your school in your job? In China, you mean? No, not, not back then. Back then, we didn't even see that many white people, let alone black people. Um, and, uh, but they're in my hometown, actually. My hometown has actually become a magnet for a lot of Africans, and I think it now has, um, it's now got a huge African population, um, and in fact, they're, oftentimes they complain about being discriminated against by the locals and by the police, and I think a lot of these African immigrants have showed up in China to do business, and. Um, to find economic opportunities, and and just like lots of other people from other countries have showed up in China, these African immigrants have showed up in China. But um, and they live in sort of they they in my hometown, at least the city of Guangzhou. Nowadays, many of them do live in one neighborhood, um, and ironically, many of them complain about the Chinese police being very brutal against them. And, and in general, you know, in China, the police don't need to behave according to the same legal standards that we do here, so Chinese citizens regularly complain about the police being brutal too. Um, but um, but when I was a kid, I didn't really see those, I, I, I don't think I saw the first black person in my life until I showed up in the inner city of Oakland, California. Um, but let me also add something to the question you asked earlier. Um, regardless of what, how Chinese culture is sort of has traditionally viewed other cultures. China does have extremely robust and friendly relations with a lot of African countries. It does a lot of business there, and so um, so a lot of African dignitaries show up in China a lot. And so, despite the observations we might make about Chinese culture and racism um, on a state-to-state -state level, the Chinese state actually has. Um, Pretty friendly relations with a lot of African countries, including with those, you know, um, countries in Africa that the U.S. considers to be dictatorships and unsavory regimes. But China doesn't um, isn't nearly as picky about picking its friends as we are, and so they, you know, so like it's got great relations with countries like Zimbabwe and others. Yes, sir. Uh, you mean right now? or back when I was growing up. Uh, I grew up as communism as my, with communism as my religion, um, and that was the case for most other people. Um, this doesn't mean that people didn't harbor closet 
believes, it's just that um, communism considers religion to be dangerous and unscientific, and that was, you know, and during the Cultural Revolution and also during the years prior to that, the communist regime did a lot to try to stamp out um, religion and to, to persecute religious believers. Um, over the past 30 years or so, religion has undergone a huge revival. Uh, so you can, you know, so you've got um, a significant increase today in Buddhist believers, Taoist believers, um, Christian believers. Um, I guess the only thing that really hasn't increased, I mean, the, the only thing, the group that uh, hasn't really undergone any kind of major revival in China is the Jewish population, because there aren't really, I mean, if you, if you uh, put aside the Jewish expats in China, you know, most Chinese are not Jews, and, and they certainly weren't going to convert to Judaism. So, but the Christian and Catholic um, populations have, their numbers have increased significantly. Um, the situation now is very complicated. On the one hand, people are able to worship in ways that they were simply not able to do 30 years ago. The churches on Sundays are jam-packed, and um, and a lot of pastors, um, a lot of pastors give very moving sermons openly, and people do worship openly. The problem is that all of that activity has to take place within the framework set up by the state. And so, if you're someone who operates outside of that framework, then you are very likely to run into trouble with the government. So. One thing that's very controversial for Catholics in China is that the Chinese government appoints their bishops. Uh, Rome does not, and this is something that, you know, for Catholics here in, in the U.S. or, or else, elsewhere, um, they find that extremely repulsive. Um, as far as Protestants are concerned, um, uh, the story is a little bit different. So a lot of Protestants do worship at churches. Um, that are registered with the state, and then it's a way for the state to keep track of what the churches do. And a lot of these churches do, you know, provide, um, you know, they provide church services. They they operate although on the surface it looks like they operate no differently from a regular church, but there are a lot of activities that they can't do. Um, and if you decide that you don't want to belong to a church that's sanctioned by the state, and there are um, there's this movement in China for a lot of regular citizens where they belong to these things called underground churches or house churches, and um, and a lot of people tend to gather together at someone's house to read the Bible, to worship, um, and they feel that for a lot of these believers, they feel that it's better to do it that way rather than to do it at a state-sanctioned church. And, um, and people who are in this group, in this category, tend to run into a lot more trouble with the state. Um, uh, the government doesn't like having a bunch of people operating outside of its purview. Um, it won't necessarily throw you in jail every time you go to one of these house churches, but there are a lot of these house churches that are that are, um, that are are persecuted, that are watched or targeted by the state. Um, I don't, it's hard for me to say how systematically they go out through these house churches, but it's definitely a problem. And in fact, about a month ago, or maybe not even a month ago, um, one of the prominent leaders of that house church movement um, uh, came to the United States on a self-imposed exile. He is a very famous, famous writer in China, in fact, 10 years ago, when his books were being sold widely in China. He used to purchase his books at bookstores and read them, but then over in over the years, he converted to Christianity. Um, he's someone who doesn't really like other people telling him what to think, and um, for a, he's also a pro-democracy activist. And so, for a whole host of reasons, he after he converted, he started participating in these things that are called house churches, and and that became a big problem because not only was he persona non grata because he was advocating democracy. He was writing all these nasty articles about the Chinese government and the Chinese party. And then on top of that, he belonged to this house church where he was complaining all the time about how the government was infringing on their religious liberty. And so 
finally, um, sometime last year, I believe, or maybe the year before, he, um, they tortured him. And, you know, and prior to that, they had harassed him and put him under house arrest and this and that. But then after they tortured him, finally he said he had, had enough. And then so he, um, what he ended up doing was that he went to the Chinese authorities and said, I need to leave. I want to leave, to leave for the United States. And if you don't let me, I'm going to make a huge scene. Um, in front, you know, I'm going to call in the press. And, and, as, um, and then, you know, that's how he tell, that that's the story he told, um, he told us after he arrived here. And, and then so the Chinese government allowed him to, to leave, um, but he is sort of a, someone who represents the Christians, a lot of the Christians in China, you know, even though there are Christians who would much rather not go through that kind of, um, that kind of abuse and that kind of trouble and this, you know, most people don't want to subject themselves to torture. They don't have to, but you know. Um, but he's sort of someone who represents a Christian as well as a democracy activist who just won't. He doesn't. You know, he, won't, he doesn't want to submit to the reign of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, and I think the you know a, a lot of Christians in China look to him um, and have applauded his efforts. Yes. I have. I used to go back quite a bit. At one point, um, um, at one point, I lived in Hong Kong um, after I graduated from college. So I used to go back across the border every weekend or two. Um, and then over the years, uh, I've spent a lot of time working on China issues too, and so that's taken me back quite often. These days, I go back a few times. Oh, I know a friend there, and um, and I write a lot about the free market and the uh, free market think tank, and so things just fell together. Yes, ma'am. I'm just curious about. I know you talked a little bit about the one child policy in your book and your aunt and some of the different things, but do you see things shifting at some point in China, especially with effects on like the male female ratio and everything that's and the and also the ratio of young people to yeah, I um, I think there's a lot of talk about that, and in fact, um, there's uh, talk in Guangdong province of putting in place putting in place a policy where the uh, where there would be an exemption for people who's um, so if you I think it goes something like this: if you're the only child in your family spouse is the only child in his or her family, then the government would be like, would be willing to entertain letting you have a second child. Um, and that's something that's been talked about quite a bit, and it's an effort for the government to loosen up um, the controls. It's, um, um, I think it's something that the government realizes it has become a problem, um, and it's, you know, but it's also hard to fix it very short amount of time. So there's um, there's really no easy <laughs> answer. But I, I, I do think that the government is willing to um, to entertain different options of making changes. Uh, but the problem is that when you have very draconian government policies like that, you end up with very draconian and undesirable, um, and undesirable results. And so aside from the emotional trauma that you inflict on your own citizens, you now have a situation where China will have far many more older people very soon than the younger people who can, you know, support them. And so China's going to age, and, and you know, and um, in order for economic reform in China or economic growth in China to to keep going on in, the, in future years, it has to have a large young population, you know, a large population of younger people. Work, but then increasingly, people are getting older, and then the younger population is getting smaller and smaller. And they're going to have to divert their resources to take care of all these older people. But that's, you know, that's turned out to be a very undesirable effect of the one-child policy. Yes. Have you been able to return to the ghetto in Oakland and take your message and your book? I, I certainly returned to Oakland and the ghetto. My family actually didn't 
away until about six years ago. Um, I left for college when I was 18, but I, you know, my family stayed behind, um, and then I continued to return whenever you know I had a vacation from school or holidays from work or, or whatever. Um, we and, and I talk about this in the book too. I talk, sort of talk a little bit about um, the decision I made to to help my family move away. Um, I when I wrote this book, I actually returned to Oakland to and, and went back to my old neighborhood um, and uh, and I do still have friends in Oakland, so I, I do return from time to time. Um, I haven't tried to do a book talk in Oakland. Um, I uh, haven't, I haven't, you know, attempted to take my message to City Hall or anything like that. Um, I, I, not yet, not yet. Um, I mean, I thought that one most, a most natural place for me to go would be my high school, and uh, and I, it's I haven't been most aggressive about getting that opportunity, and um, I, I think Oakland over the years has changed a lot too. It's not nearly as dumpy as it used to be. Um, I <laughs> give Governor Jerry Brown a lot of credit for much of the work that he did when he was mayor of Oakland, and you know. And, a lot of the things that he did to re, to help the city sort of undergo a gentrification process and, and all that, but um, but as you know, over the past year or so, the Occupy Oakland movement has been going on there, and um, and I have gone back to Oakland to visit to sort of see the Occupy movement and, and kind of take a look at the space spaces that they've occupied and. Um, and each time it sort of brought me back to my childhood because you know a lot of um, a lot of the violence that has gone on, a lot of the anarchy and, and just um, the uh, the total absence of responsibility. Um, and I, I do know that not every protester in the Occupy movement feels that way, but there's been a, there's been a huge amount of anarchy in Oakland and. It, it, it seems, it, at least on the surface, it appears that Oakland has suffered more from the Occupy movement than other cities in the U.S. And so, um, every time I've gone back, I've been quite disturbed about that, and I feel that the brokenness that I saw when I was growing up there as a kid continues to plague the city, and it's really too bad because I know that you know a lot of politicians and, and a lot of regular citizens in Oakland have tried to, to make the city a better place. And, Downtown Oakland, for instance, is a place that they a lot of people have tried to um, um, have, have tried to um, to rejuvenate, and, and you know, and then and it really takes a, and a movement like that has actually had a very dire effect on local businesses. Jobs have been lost. Um, police resources have been diverted from a city that's already pretty unsafe, and um, um, and you know, and, and it's really just too bad. Yes, sir. Thank you. 
it's something that Chinese parents place a lot of emphasis on. And, um, and I think a lot of Chinese uh, parents here in the U.S. tend to put a lot of emphasis on that too. Um, uh, certainly the Chinese community here isn't monolithic in any way, but I, I think um, as a culture, Chinese people do tend to place a lot of emphasis on it. Um, with that said, I think the, um, the, the, this, I, I, I mean, even though I've talked a lot about how broken Oakland is, and certainly the public school, public education system in Oakland is, is not something to write home about, um, I think there is a lot to be said about the American educational system, particularly our college educational system, um, even though Chinese parents do place a lot of emphasis on education, much like I think a lot of other parents in Asia do, like the Japanese and the Koreans, for instance, also um, prize education and you know, tend to drive their kids to near insanity to make sure they get the best grades and all that, right? So I think the Chinese, you know, certainly aren't unique on that front, but I think in a lot of these Asian countries, um, the education isn't nearly um, as, um, it's, it's not, on some levels, it's not nearly as effective as what we have here. There's a lot less um, emphasis on free thought. Whereas, you know, going to college here and getting a liberal arts education, one of the fundamental things that, uh, that we learn in that process is that free thinking, you know, you need to, you're supposed to learn to think for yourself, and college is supposed to give you the tools. Um, and certainly different disciplines um, value different things. If you're a scientist or, or an engineer, you know, you study very different things compared to a government major like me. Um, which is why I didn't go and do the hard work and become a scientist. But, but I do think that in, in a lot of Asian countries, even though there is this emphasis on education, there is not always as much emphasis on free thinking, and which is why a lot of these countries, particularly China, are now trying to figure out how best can we innovate, because we definitely have a lot of great scientists and you know, engineers and computer people, but, but you know, the best inventions come from America, it seems, you know, and um, the best ideas, it seems, you know, Silicon Valley, for instance, not too far away from here, um, it is a hotbed of ideas, and people execute those ideas and turn them into multi-billion-dollar companies. And and I think you know, and I, I think that says a lot about our education educational system too. Um, and you know, and, and someone like Mark Zuckerberg or Bill Gates, both of whom dropped out of college, they now are some, you know two of the most successful people you see. Um, that says a lot too. You know, Lack there, the, the edu education or the lack thereof does not you know, prevent you from becoming successful in America or worldwide. And, and I think that's something that other countries like China are beginning to look at a lot as well. Um, uh, on the question of Chinese here in America, one of the things, and I'm grateful to you for asking the question, even though you may not have asked it for that reason, but one of the things I actually really hate is that book by Tiger Mother. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. Um, and I hate that book because, um, first of all, I don't think that Chinese parents are necessarily that extreme. She is a very extreme example of someone who calls herself uh, a follower of the method of Chinese parenting. But, um, but there's also something really problematic with making sure that your kids only do certain things well, right? So I talked about Jeremy Lin earlier. If he um, had been a son of Tiger Mother, he would have never achieved his basketball greatness because she wouldn't have allowed him to play basketball. Her daughters were told to play the violin and, and they, you know, couldn't even be in a school play. So, you know, of course, you know, if she had a son that he probably wouldn't have been able to play basketball. And I think a lot of times the Asian community ends up uh, be pretty dominant in certain industries, and I think there are lots of different reasons for that. For instance, I think if you know you're an immigrant and you come here with a great science background or math background, it's a lot harder for you to go become a writer. So you go and pursue a, a profession that works to your comparative advantage, right? And so you see a lot of Asians, for instance, in the computer industry and in science. And so, um, so I, I think that plays. You know, there are, there are all kinds of things that limit our choices. And Asian community, they're hard for those factors that have limited our choices. But um, 
Um, and sometimes, you know, it's just that maybe, you know, it's a personal issue too. Not there are a lot of Asians who are probably not as interested in becoming basketball players or football players. That could be part of it too. But, but it doesn't mean that Chinese parents should just go force their kids to go to Harvard because that's the only thing that would make you succeed. Um, and and I, I think that my hope is that over time, um, as more and more, you know, children of certain minority, uh, of certain ethnicities grow up here in the U.S. and are given the opportunities that, that other kids have here in the U.S. and language is not a problem, and economics becomes less of a problem, that people will pursue all kinds of different professions. Um, when I go to China or Asia, one of the most liberating things for me to see is that Asian people are in all fields. They're right? baseball players, they're garbage men, they, you know, they're not just scientists, and then, of course, they're dictators, too, and so um, not that I would advise any. Asian kids here in the U.S. to take on that role, but um, but you know, but I think all of those professions to be open to everybody, Asians included, and there's no reason why Chinese parents should you know should force their kids out of those professions. In the back. So one fun question first before my serious question: Do you still do kung fu or whatever it is you guys in trouble for in like sixth grade? Like, uh, How did you know about that? It's in your book, right? <laughs> I did fake kung fu. I I, I joined a a, a a martial arts group, but um, but I never actually did any martial arts. Okay. okay. <laughs> so now my serious question: um, How do we as Americans compare ourselves? You know, there's all these comparisons with us and Chinese, the great rail system, and I, sometimes I have a trouble with that because it's you can't compare. I have, it's very hard to compare. China has a monolithic system, dictatorship, you know, communist system where there's no checks and balances. You know, the reporters, the reporters are not going to say, you know, this is losing money, but we're backfilling it this way. And so, the entrepreneurial side is 100%. I agree with, but when we try to compare what we're doing economically with big public work projects, isn't that isn't that hard to really um, just or hard to really drill down to, to, to see? Is that Chinese economic model going to sustain itself? Because there's no real check to balance. Right, I agree with you completely. And um, I actually brought two magazines here today. Actually, two issues of the magazine. Um, there's a, this one, and the, type, the headline is Dictators and Their Enablers. And I bet I was wondering about that. Um, so I, uh, as I've been mentioning, Introduction. I write a lot of policy issues, and one of the policy issues I look into is um, the intersection between economic and political freedom, particularly as it relates to China's economic growth and, and the development of um, political opportunities there um, or political liberalization there. And so, in the um, um, February 20th of this magazine, the Weekly Standard, um, as well as the October 24th issue. Standard. I um, wrote a couple of articles about pr precisely the question you posed, which is that even though a lot of people in America have been talking about the China model, and so you see President Barack Obama um, spending a lot of time pointing to what they're doing in China and saying, you know, are we going to let the Chinese do that? And why don't we spend, you know, we could certainly be investing in our renewable energy, in our infrastructure. And then you know you have others like Thomas Friedman from the New York Times who um, actually went out and said to a reporter, I wish, or I think he said something like, "What if we could just be China for one day, just one day?" Um, and the reason he asked that question was because he felt that the Chinese authoritarian government can make all these big decisions very quickly. But we here in the U.S are just mired in all that gridlock and you know John Bader can't come to an agreement with Harry Reid and certainly you know um, Eric Cantor and Paul Ryan aren't gonna buckle to Obama's pressures and so there are all these big issues here in the US that we can't even decide whether to raise our debt limit. Um, and you know and so let alone building high speed rail all across the country. And so um, the two articles that I, I one is titled A Model to Avoid the Dark Side of Chinese Authoritarianism, and then the other one is called The 
storage image sheets. Um, and they're both online if you'd like to look them up. Um, you can also find them on my website, which is yingma.org. Um, and what I argue is that the way that China has gone about um, promoting its economic growth, it actually imposes a lot of economic inefficiencies. It's just that a lot of us here don't see those inefficiencies. And, and there is also a, a tremendous amount of human cost that, um, that we don't personally feel and that the Chinese government often tries to hide. And so let me just give you a couple of examples. Um, the high speed rail uh, uh, project, for instance, for a long time we were, you know, a lot of the people here in the US have seemed very disturbed that China built this incredible high speed rail system in, um, in about seven years or so. It's now the largest system in the world. And um, at one point they had trains that traveled in at speeds higher than anywhere else in the, in, in the world. Um, and um, what we didn't really talk about, even though it was actually quite obvious in China, was that there was endemic corruption because they operated in, in a system that didn't have checks and balances. Um, there were serious safety concerns because the rail ministry was given a whole bunch of money to pursue this big project. And, and, um, and the Chinese government saw the project as a sign of national pride and, and national prestige, and so they rushed through a lot of these um, construction projects and high speed rail projects. But then safety and um, um, safety ended up some, be, becoming something that took a toll, and um, you know, and so as a result of this onslaught of funds, a lot of state-owned enterprises I mean, ended up getting a lot of benefits. Um, but the private sector, for the most part,